Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via YouTube, Stitcher and the Apple Podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the, co- the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalists. Mike, how are you doing? I'm also the cow finder of the Croydon Constitutionalists. <laughs> We've moved when, into farming. Whenever a cow goes missing in Croydon, if it's a constitutionalist matter, I'm all over it. It's been sacrificed. I'm, I'm, I'm great, Dan. I'm great, Dan. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, um, we're not talking about cows today, but we, we are a bit, of a, a bit of a herder of men today because mm. we've uh, we've actually got some special guests, haven't we? Uh, Mike, who have we got with us today? We do indeed. So uh, with us here today, we have Hong Wei Cheng, the Croydon branch UKIP chairman, and Sean Finch. The London and South East Regional Regional Coordinator of the Libertarian Party. Thank you. Hello. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. So, uh, before we get going, just say a few words about our, our special guest today. Uh, Hong Wei is the, Mike says, the chairman of UKIP in Croydon. You were a council candidate in Old Coulston Ward in the Croydon Council elections in 2018. Uh, but before that, I believe you were a parliamentary candidate in Lewisham Western Penge in the 2017 general election. Yes, I was. That was quite an experience. I'm sure it was. We'll maybe talk about that uh, a bit later. Uh, and Sean, you're the London and South East Regional Coordinator of the Libertarian Party. Yeah, it's quite a mouthful. I, 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 forget, I forget the title myself occasionally. <laughs> Well, some of us have had to write it down. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, you, uh, I believe, were a parliamentary candidate in the infamous oh, East wow. by-election back in uh, 2018, so we may... Uh, I still have night terrors every night about we, it. We, we, may, uh, we may stumble upon that a little bit later on as well. Um, and most recently, I believe you were the parliamentary candidate in Sevenoaks yep. in the uh, very recent December 2019 general election. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, now, the reason we've gathered you here today, dearly beloved as it were is because uh, see the, the, the Croydon <laughs> Constitutionalists are a, a classically uh, liberal organisation wishing to spread such values uh, and both UKIP and the Libertarian Party uh, have traditionally espoused such libertarian positions mm. uh, so we thought it would be interesting to get to, two local people uh, in to discuss such matters and I think it, for, the, uh, for the listeners at uh, home or wherever you may be uh, I think it's important just to just look at what the uh, the party constitutions say um, about the, the positions. Uh, so UKIP, obviously best known for its position on the, the European Union um, and uh, the supporters of Brexit before the term Brexit was ever coined. Um, perhaps a little less well known is that uh, UKIP is apparently a libertarian party. Indeed, in its constitution, it describes itself as the party is a democratic libertarian party and will espouse policies which promote and encourage those who aspire to improve their personal situation and who seek to be self-reliant whilst providing protection for those genuinely in need. It also seeks to diminish the role of the state. Yeah. Um, moving on to the Libertarian Party, one might think the uh, it was in the name, but there you go. We'll, we'll nonetheless look at the constitution, just to be fair. Um, describes libertarianism as a political and philosophical ideology based upon the principles of self-ownership and self-responsibility. It posits that all individuals have the right to control their own lives, bodies and properly acquired by honest means. Further, each individual must also respect the equal rights of others. So, so far, so good. Um, Hung Wei, if I can just uh, start with you. Uh, Can you tell us a little bit about UKIP and how you feel that the party does support individual freedom? Well, um, I could tell you by expressing how I came to uh, be involved in UKIP, which was that I've been involved, I've been um, interested in uh, politics, uh, philosophy, and economics, and how uh, political decisions uh, impact uh, you in your everyday life and impact society. And eventually, with a bit of experimenting in terms of my own life and observation of other people's lives, and uh, just studying the data, really, I came to the position that um, balancing 
uh, overall libertarian principles against a little bit of uh, state involvement is the right uh, approach. Uh, so uh, I personally lean uh, quite heavily in favour of libertarianism and and I think UKIP strikes just about the right balance between uh, giving individuals, uh, empowering individuals to uh, take responsibility for their own lives and uh, having the right amount of intervention in society to smooth out and balance out any, any wrinkles. Do you want me to be more specific on policies or just this overarching? No, I, th- I, think, I think that will suffice for now. That's your opening statement, as it were. Yeah, sure. Um, we'll, we'll go on later to talk about individual um, aspects and different policies. Uh, so, Sean, the Libertarian Party, what's yep. it all about? Well, it's a party of liberty, freedom, less government, less taxation. Obviously, it does you know, impose the values of liberty, like we said, read earlier about self-ownership. And that obviously means that you, the idea that you own your own body, that you don't... Um, you don't need someone to tell you how to live your life and what to do. You don't need a big nanny state to tell you to do that. Mm. You know, because it's getting to a point now in society where governments are getting bigger and they're sort of encroaching their role upon what telling individuals what to do. So we sort of we got to this point where you know, if you can be responsible with your own body and you know, you can take things as long as it doesn't affect anyone else, I use a sort of the non aggression principle it doesn't affect anyone else's life. But then you should be able to do that. You should be able to do what you want with your life. And so it sort of comes to this ability where I see, we do believe we do believe in a state. We're not like an um, anarcho-capitalist sort of uh, party. We are minarchists officially, as we should further read in the Constitution. So we do believe in the role of government, but that should be sort of very, very minimal, where it should be basically in the role of defence, which should be more about military, the courts, police... And, and that's it and everything else really you should be able to take care of yourself because we see the bigger the government the more the more damage it does is that good intentions lead to bad consequences and that's mm. basically what liberty is about yeah okay so uh, thanks both for you for, for explaining the position of your own parties I guess there's a bit of a sort of chime against that what do you think of each other party's position and where do you see the challenges perhaps in each other's party so uh, Hong Wei, I'll give you a chance maybe to talk where where you see the differences between UKIP and um, and the Libertarians and and where you see the challenges there for maybe a couple of minutes each. So yeah, um, I see that the Libertarian Party uh, are generally uh, very well libertarian uh, to the core and and, and principle very principled, uh, but I think there is uh, more of a role uh, in uh, in in the state right, yeah. to to. Uh, Intervene to do something, for example, to direct the market, to to put uh, investment in places where uh, it might be of strategic importance mm. to to the to the country, to the nation. So it involves a bit of governmental decisions, uh, and I think um, so. For example, we we're both uh, both parties are strongly in favour of individual liberties, uh, but individual liberties, I think. Uh, without uh, legislative or state uh, protection uh, is easily infringed by the the strong uh, over the weak. So I see that there's a place uh, for the government to to take part in that. Um, In terms of um, economics, uh, I I prefer a lower Mm. tax as well. Uh, But I think um, tax can be used to to shape the market, so uh, shape market and society. So for example, something like drugs, I'm not very libertarian on allowing uh, drugs into society, which would, which could and does uh, damage uh, mm. families and the fabric of society. So I think it's a good thing to uh, be a bit harsher on the things that are, are without a doubt, uh, damaging to society. Mm. Well, thank you. And so, so Sean, if I might uh, pose the, the the same question to you, how do you see the the key differences well, there between I, them? I, I do disagree with you know with what was said there about the state because I, mm. I like I said earlier like, I think no matter how well the intention like mm. the path to hell is always paved with good intentions mm. is that you know governments aren't good the people are good you know you can't mm. it's a collective thing usually nine times out of ten and you see this with a lot of sort of socialist countries in the past is that the best intentions that they'll try and take over everything say so, oh don't worry we'll We'll look after, you know, we'll do everything for you. But nine times out of ten, it always mm. ends in, in ruin. I think, personally, 
Now, I'm more of a sort of Milton Friedman kind of follower in terms of economics. Uh, a lot of people are Ludwig von Mises. You know, I can go laissez-faire, you know, cool, great. But I think that they have a lot of uh, problems when they stick their hand into the market. I think that the market, and people get, yeah. I'm not, people sort of don't quite understand what the market is. They see it's mm. a sort of, what is the market? Well, the market is simply all of us. It's yeah. all of us individuals, yeah. just millions and millions of people <coughs> just making decisions for their own personal benefit. And people aren't going to make bad decisions, are they? They're going to, they, they want to benefit things which, which will make them more prosperous and stuff. So, well, but, but what the government does is something called third-hand economics where yeah. it's not their money and they're probably not going to be using the service. So this is like a thing with the NHS now. It's not their money. And that's the reason why the NHS isn't really fantastic, if I'm honest, because they, they use taxpayers' money. There's no such thing as government money. It's only taxpayers' money. And they use services that they're, going to, they're never going to probably going to use. So it's human nature that they're not going to do a very good job on on the on on the econ on either the economy and, and sort of government services. And that's I think a difference between UKIP and the Libertarian Party. I think UKIP, looking at the last manifesto, where they want they want to, uh, all the utilities, they want to uh, renationalise, they want the NH they want the NHS to be fully nationalised. Um, there's the trains they want to be nationalised, and I think you can't have low taxes and have a bigger state. It doesn't. It doesn't really work that way. You so, so sorry to, uh, to I just try a bit quick there, but that's an interesting thing. The last UKIP manifesto, and and I say this to someone that ran on the 2017 one, mm. did seem more uh, state control mm. over <coughs> vi over industry than than I I certainly remember from the 2017 one. Now I didn't. Study it in the same way. Obviously, like the twenty seventeen, I, I kind of tried to learn inside out. Yeah. But but um, but yeah, what 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 changed there? What was the difference? I don't think it's it's um, anything uh, major that changed uh, changed uh, in the uh, principles uh, guiding UK. Obviously, the leadership had changed, um, but I think it stuck to broadly the same principle of of market intervention where uh, necessary, where uh, helpful. So. Um, Coming on to intervention, so there are, there are a couple of things that I wanted to pick up on what you just mm -hmm. said then, sure. uh, starting with uh, intervention. Now, I think there are different degrees of intervention. I think you can just go in and command the entire uh, sector. I think that would be really bad because people, the more power they get, the more likely they are to mess things up and mm -hmm. the more they mess, and, and when they, they mess up on such a large scale, massive chaos and, 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 and horrible things ensue. But I think there's such a thing as light touch intervention. Just increase a bit of tax on this or um, increase a bit of investment on there, uh, in that sector mm. or tax breaks in that sector. Mm -hmm. That could help shape and nudge the market in certain ways without ma massive um, fallout from, from bad decisions. Uh, can I um, come on to uh, the bad decisions thing? Uh, you say that people generally don't make bad decisions. Nine times out of ten, people do make bad decisions every now and then. But nine times out of ten, uh, yeah, I think I think yeah. people make decisions that they think are they good take for risks, them. Don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah they yeah. take risks and they think that they make decisions that are good for them. But we're all human. We mm. all make bad decisions. I mean, I think the ratio is probably closer to 50-50 good decisions to bad decisions. Mm. And generally, as you get older, hopefully you learn from your previous uh, mistakes, but you make mistakes as you go along. Um, so I think there are a lot of bad decisions uh, being made. And sometimes when you know something is um, the, the bad for something, it far outweighs uh, the good of letting people choose to do it. Um, maybe it's, a it's time to intervene in that sort of um, uh, sector. I, I, I just don't think that what what makes you think that the government are good at making decisions? Like, you know, oh, we're, we're going to nudge it into this direction. Mm. Well, in my sort of understanding is mm. that, well, governments don't really understand price and values. I mean, who are they, who are they to determine what people want? People will naturally, mm. in trends, they'll just naturally make the right decision. I mean, like in Canada at the moment, they've introduced the uh, legalization of marijuana mm. and only the government can sell mm. wheat, can sell marijuana. And guess what? They're making a loss. Only a government <laughs> could make loss on selling weed. Like, you know, like, because it's so highly regulated that yeah. I know people in Canada that say, I'm still buying it from my dealer, you mm. know, because it's still more cheap, even though it's mm. like on the black market, yeah. it's still more cheaper to buy from a market than it is from the, from, from the legalized, yeah. regulated government because they're, they're trying to have a hand in it. Yeah. They want to make money from it. And if you could simply sort of regulate it like the vape industry now, just let people, like, you know, let people, let the market deal with it, let people set up yeah. their own little shops and stuff, yeah. and just let it, just let, leave it like that. You don't need to highly regulate it, just leave it like uh, that. Uh, just 
reference Canada there. Um, having been to Canada, uh, I think it might be at a state level rather than necessarily um, a Canada-wide level. Okay. But certainly Ontario has has legalized uh, has legalized cannabis, and as you say, you have to go to the state shop to buy it. Yeah. But it's but it's it's funnier than that because obviously that's a relatively recent uh, change. Mm. Um, for years, you've only been able to buy booze. Booze, yes. Yeah, so from I've been Canada the soon, official yeah. booze shop. I was shocked in by it. I was, I was in a supermarket. Um, Where's the booze yeah. section? They you can, like, you can buy it in a restaurant or something like that, or the yes. baseball and things yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of a, a normal shop or a supermarket, yeah, you want to get a six pack market, or something. Yeah, yeah, something like you have to go to the to New South Wales and Australia is very similar. Yeah, with the bottle shops. Yeah, yeah, so so it's a bit strange, isn't it? How mm. the, they're they're purporting to be really liberal. In the sense, uh, you know, in well, terms of well, in terms of we're no, legalizing I, I think, weed, I, I think that, 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 that word not. has been totally yeah. butchered. I think people who call themselves liberal now, or in the mainstream sense, they're they're illiberal. They're, they're you know people who call themselves progressives. They're actually regressive, you know. And this is the sort of crazy world that we live in. Yeah, now. yeah absolutely. But I think that we're we're going off a little bit. Could I? <laughs> Go for it. Could I come back to um, what you said earlier about? Um, uh, the risks and the um, basically you were making an economic argument for for uh, protecting individual uh, liberties. Mm. Now um, I I don't know if you remember earlier I said that uh, the, the state should have a uh, uh, an involvement in in getting um, making pushing uh, making strategic uh, decisions I guess uh, policies that might be strategically um, helpful or advantageous to the country. Mm-hmm. So back in uh, World War Two. Yeah. Uh, Long before um, TVs were uh, mass media, yeah. uh, the government, the UK government, uh, pushed for TV screens to be manufactured. They basically yeah. created the BBC. Uh, I, I think, yeah, but that's. I think that's. Hang on, can, can we finish yeah, the story on. first? Uh, and and uh, secretly, the reason behind that was because they were building radar towers and they needed the, these screens to to uh, for their for their fighter craft and for their ground stations to 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 use to see the radar to read the radar now uh, that's the sort of thing and and it turns out that tv suddenly became a massive thing and the uk was at the forefront of it likewise in france um the, the they had a big thing about motor cars and even now the french uh, is still uh, big on on uh, motor vehicles yeah What's and presumably the French were doing that for reasons of being on the Central European plane and wanting well, actually, to... I don't know why they were okay, doing that. Okay, it wasn't. Yeah. A, it was a yeah. It was just an observation. The, the French, of course, um, went on with uh, with Russia to have their own uh, system of color television called CCAM, whereas we had PAL and America mm-hmm. had NTSC. Mm. So they went on to try to control. Uh, <laughs> the way of viewing television and um, uh, a very protectionist measure because can, can I bring this a bit more up to date so, so there's, a, there's a question here around when should government get involved and when shouldn't government get involved the, the question I want to ask so something that's quite pertinent thing immigration mm-hmm. where do your parties see government's involvement in, in something like that oh that's a very good question I think you hit the nail on the head there immigration um, well I'll, I'll give you my personal stance, and I'll, I'll try and give the party's stance as well. Um, in in our uh, manifestos, um, the last, well, at least the last two, anyway, I wasn't a member of the party prior to that. It does, we do have a sort of uh, clause that does say, yeah, we do want open borders, but on the very strict sort of condition that the people we open the borders with also are libertarian countries and also are on the same sort of GDP sort of wealth sort of status as us Mm. and basically we were also on the condition as well also that there is pretty much no welfare state in this country I mean so Mm. if people want to come over then there is no chance that well there is no welfare state so a lot of people not all not all immigrants but there is quite a few many people that are economic migrants Mm. and they know that there is that we're a little bit soft and we let people in and then they milk off the off off the welfare state and i don't think that's very noble to the people who do pay their taxes as much as i dislike taxes uh that people are paying their taxes and then there are people coming along because you know i think it's human nature i think if you you come from a country that is quite in in great poverty and you hear that there is a country out there that is pretty much giving free housing 
that is giving like, free, I'm using air quotations there, free healthcare service and state various... State provided. Un- uh, yeah, we're state well, it's us, we're paying for it, aren't yeah. we? Uh, and all these things, well, I think, yeah, I think if I was that if individual, yeah, I think I would try and make a better life for myself by coming no, out of with course. it. And I think the welfare state, what it does, is effectively, again, good intentions, <laughs> but I think what it does, it actually creates a a sort of dependency and uh, it sort of encourages people to come along and take advantage of that. Yeah, I think that's a so, pull factor to that. So we do have open border, but again, it's against those, get rid of the welfare state. Yeah. And the countries have to be also a libertarian country and basically be on the same sort of G- GDP sort of level of us. So yeah, <laughs> I think I think this is I think that's very good actually. It it, it illustrates um, quite and clearly also, why. And also, I I do think the market does depending on the market. If there's low um, unemployment and we need more workers into the country, then yeah, mm. I think the border should be flexible. Mm. Yeah, okay, let some people in. Yeah, I think I think that that shows um, why I take the the UKIP stance as it is because. Um, in all honesty, we're not going to get rid of the welfare state. That's just not realistic. Um, similar GDP, yeah, we can do that. Libertarian, equally libertarian. Well, the UK isn't libertarian, so equally libertarian is pretty easy to find. But if we were going mm. to be libertarian as the Libertarian Party would have it, there's pretty much no other country in the world uh, that's like that. So um, I think that's where uh, UK policies are a lot more uh, realistic mm. in uh, controlling, uh, wanting to control immigration. Now, I say this as a... For those listeners who don't know, I am an immigrant myself. I've been here over 20 years. So mm. whether or not you call that settled, up to you. I'm not culturally British and my values are slightly different. It's quite international. Um, but definitely uh, I have uh, libertarian values. Mm. But it's also um, tempered with uh, real politic, if you will. Um, I think if um, we think about uh, immigration uh, to uh, fill the gaps, this is why UKIP has a quite a practicable uh, policy of of um, making easier to get uh, temporary uh, work visas, but must be temporary, does not automatically translate into uh, resident uh, residency or, or settled status. And mm-hmm. I think um, having open borders uh, brings on another issue that's entirely non-economic, but all to, all to, uh, all to do with uh, social cohesion. Different uh, countries not only have different languages, they might even have the same language, but they have very different cultures and therefore mm. very different values. Now, when the values, when, when conflicting values come up close and rub up against each other, there's social conflict. And it's very, very difficult for a free market to be able to account for something like this. You just end up with, with um, conflict, open conflict, or or uh, as the British are so good at it, passive, uh, hidden conflict, uh, when, when people are just... Um, just take steps to avoid each other and I, yeah. I think it's very hard to to counter that with uh, address that with so open what, borders so what are UKIP's um, proposals to stop or you know UKIP, mass immigration I think or it's famous for uh, wanting to control immigration mm. I don't think it's fair to say that UKIP wants to uh, uh, well limit it I should say well yeah. no, we, we do want to limit immigration but uh, it's, it's very hard uh, right now because the government uh, does not keep track of who comes in and who comes out. We do all that paperwork, we fill in the landing cards, you might not know as a a uh, uh, non-immigrant, but they don't actually uh, store it in a central database, or at least not as far as uh, I'm aware. Mm -hmm. We do have, so, we do have a net zero uh, migration, uh, immigration uh, policy, Mm -hmm. but uh, this is conditional on us being in government so that we can put in place uh, these uh, systems to track who comes in and who goes out so that we have exact numbers then we can control it so b- yeah. another big problem of uh, immigration or at least uncontrolled immigration is that infrastructure gets overloaded far too quickly especially mm. in a in a country like the UK where the state is so involved in providing for critical infrastructure like roads and like uh, trains and and big one health and housing mm. uh, it, it we can't scale up until mm. uh, we get uh, we can't scale up unless we completely liberalize the market which is very very difficult to do and yeah. uh, we, we so well, we need to con- uh, yeah. get a handle on things so that we can bring our infrastructure up to yeah. to meet see, the capacity but, but, but this is the this is the sort of contradiction i see in like ukip they want to control the border mm. but yet they want to have a big state and like i said earlier it, what the what the welfare state does, it actually incentivizes people. The more beneficial it is, it incentivizes people to come. Look at a map there to come all the way over to the UK. And I think the I think personally, this is why 
I think that like Trump's wall in America will always fail because what do we have that is greater than a wall? A sea. We have to see. And but yet every now and then when I live in Kent, you, you see people washing up on the doors on the, on the shores of Dover and Who and yeah. various other places and they'll still risk their lives to get there. Because but if you lower that welfare state or make it minimal or have mm-hmm. no welfare state mm-hmm. at all, well then it cuts off that incentive. Whereas as I think Trump's doing it the wrong way, and Ron Paul in America, mm-hmm. who is a sort of a well known libertarian, he he said this, so you shouldn't be wasting your time wasting taxpayers' money mm-hmm. on these big walls. What you need to be doing is, is lowering the welfare state and cutting off that incentive. And then people will go, well, what's the point of going to America then if there's no welfare state? Or going to Britain if, they're, if, there's, if, if the welfare state's pretty crap, we should go to one of the other European countries instead, you know? Okay, okay. so we've talked about immigration there. I want to move us on slightly. Now, obviously immigration is not something people can always talk about. So I want to move on to the subject of free speech and expression. Oh, what are either of your parties' kind of views and policies on on... Where we should have the law and and the impact of social media companies rules and restrictions uh, on our free speech. I think on this one we're largely in agreement. I think yeah. that a free uh, uh, speech should not be curtailed in in any way. You should be able to express yourself. If mm. even if you're expressed the most vile, hateful opinions, you should still be able to to do that, and people will see you for what you are. You don't need to. Um, if you put laws to prevent it, all it will do is drive it. Um, underground if you will and and people it just won't be expressed out in the open it'll still be there um but i think uh, that that does not mean that we can't have laws against incitement uh to violence i think having laws that prevent incitement to violence or at least to convict people who are guilty of incitement to violence would deter people from well inciting violence i think what do you think john well, I mean, I, I could say so much in this. Um, I'm just trying to condense it down. We, I, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with Boris Johnson at the moment, uh, the current prime minister. That you know, he, he he goes on about all this stuff. There's one good thing he's, he's trying to make freedom of speech more um, protected on university campuses at the moment. But mm. I mean, if you are really concerned, because he did sort of make this blow hard about oh, yeah, freedom of speech and whatever. But no. yet we've got six. We still got. Um, section 127 of the Communications Act 2003, which is quite famous because it's extremely vague on how it's named. And it's basically anyone that incites violence on fear of communication. And right now in this country, we've got three major court cases going on about basically which will affect our civil liberties forever. You've got what we were talking about earlier, um, I can't remember his name, or Harry something or other from, he was an ex copper, and he's currently just done a judicial review onto this really vague crime, hate crime category that the police sort of put you in where you don't even know there's 50,000 people apparently been recorded against a hate crime, basically a black mark against your name and you don't even know that you have it against you because it's basically you say something a bit dodgy on Twitter and it's a crime slash non-crime, which is a crime, which is not a crime. So I don't know why the police are investigating it. I have no idea. And then you have another court case where a lady has uh, called a transgender individual... Some you know one of the, oh you're just a man actually blah 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 and she's been she's currently been in she's just started her her, her case in a, in a crown court somewhere in the country so you've got that and the determining in, the result of that case will therefore change everything and also you've got Julian Assange which is currently going all three cases by the way are not being talked about in the mainstream media they're talking about crap like Meghan Markle and. <sighs> And the Trump impeachment and what other nonsense we got going on in the moment. Oh, Philip Schofield came out. Oh, great. You know, all this sort of stuff. And it's just not, it's not, but the really important things are not being spoken about. So, so, so uh, okay, so I think both of your parties are, are pro free speech. And there may be a bit more of a, 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 a restriction around incitement to violence. And, and, and incitement to violence is clearly criminal conspiracy, which generally is always being considered outside of free speech and, and in most cases. But but one of the big restrictions I think a lot of people see today are our HR departments and social media organisations mm. and um, uh, clubs and societies sort of saying, "Oh, you said the wrong thing. We're going we're going to ban you off there." Mm. What's now? That's a private sphere organisation, but but with a very much a public influence. Where where do both your parties stand on on those issues? Yeah. I, I, 
Well, this, this is the thing with um, the social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook, is that they seem to want to have it both ways. You can either be a publisher or a platform. So a newspaper is a publisher, and anything that they print, they are liable for. So if they, mm. if they say, uh, if they print a story about it and it's complete lies, then they can be sued. Mm. And But with a platform, um, basically on, on Facebook, if anyone says anything you know quite hateful, like... You know, like someone prints, puts on a video of someone being decapitated, let's say, Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg, whoever, won't be held liable for it because they're a platform. But Facebook seem to want to have it both ways because in their, like in Twitter, and I think Tim Paul on the Joe Rogan podcast, he brought this great example up is that written within, they claim to be a, a platform for free speech, yeah, yeah. but written within their rules, their terms and conditions is that. If you say anything hateful towards or say something dodgy against transgender individuals, then you will be you will be thrown off the platform and possibly reported to the police. And it's just well, what, what are you? Do you yeah. do you, you know? And yeah. when, so what are you? Are you a platform so of free speech? There's or another are you contradiction. It's this there's sort a... of like so. In terms of this, I think you, they need to state what they want, what they need to be. Are you a publisher? or Are you a platform? Yeah. And you know Mark Zuckerberg's been dragged, and Joe, um, what's his name, the guy, the, the Twitter bloke, Jack, oh, no, I can't remember his name now, Joe something. They've been they've been dragged to the Senate in America, and I've been asked this question, but there's, there's, there's been no follow up to it. It's just, well, what are you guys? And I think you can't if they if they if Twitter want to say that oh we're a publisher yeah or we're we're a platform then fine they can do what they want. You're right. Yeah, so there think, is their own I think business. they've got a, an interesting uh, thing in the terms and conditions. Um, most of these uh, platforms uh, state that anything you put on their platform becomes their property. So, does that mean that they are a publisher? I think I don't know. you could argue that they are a publisher, but at the same time, they could argue that they have no control over what gets gets put on their platform. So, I guess that's their, their well, get-out clause. What they're they trying to do is they, they can't be sued. Yeah, that's yeah what it exactly. Is. So, yeah, so, if they, if they ki- so, say they say to, well, they say to a platform of free speech, and then you're kicked off, and say you, your your YouTube, let's say, and say if your business relies on that, like you're a YouTuber or whatever, are you relying on social media platforms? Mm. You can then try and sue them and go, oh no, but but we're mm. a publisher now, mm. and it's just a sort of interchangeable thing. Well, no, that, that's and I think that's the reason why. Either state what you are, yeah. So then, at least you know the rules. Then, at least you know the rules when you go in. At least the users know what to, yeah, what to expect but but, out of it. But this sort of vague definition. You don't know where you stand. Yeah, it's Weasley. So yeah, it is Weasley. But to come yeah. back to your your question about uh, on in um, free speech in, in private spheres, it's it's a very difficult one because in uh, well, if you think about it in social social situations, um, if you're hanging out with um, a bunch of friends whose you know political opinions uh, clash, you just don't bring it up. You just try not to bring it up, don't you? So it's a form of self censorship. But if you scale it up to say a university uh, level at a union, uh, say mm. a a club, a debating club, or I don't know, a Christian union, or a, or a green movement at at, at a university. Mm. I I don't know if it's right to. Um, I can see that the argument to, for them to say no, no, we don't want dissenting opinion here. But at the same time, if you don't express that dissenting opinion, so that you can you can uh, learn to argue against it, you're just doing yourself a disfavour. Well, well, that, so that's, think... that's why the rise of the snowflake generation. Exactly, because, yeah. Because people have been sort of taught this path for so long to yeah. walk this academic path, never hearing opposing ideas. Exactly. And as soon as they leave university and enter the real world, uh, they're hearing other ideas and they can't handle it and they break mm. down. You see that famously in the Donald Trump election where <laughs> all these memes are still being run, that woman just crying, oh, going, no! <laughs> <laughs> and you should have gone under it, and I think that's why it's important. You need to hear different ideas. So I remember when I went to uni for just one year, I dropped out. Um, there was always pro um, communist, pro sort of socialist mm. speakers, mm. and I went. And the BNP were uh, quite prominent then. I think it was their, 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 they were rising up. I think twenty ten was their peak, but I was going uni just slightly before that, and they were rising. And I said, "Look, I don't support the BNP, but why don't you get a BNP speaker?" Yeah. And well, I want to hear the other side of the yeah, argument. Yeah. And then, oh, and then the went, no, we can't, no, we can't have that. That's just, that's, that's just, just in case, just in case like, we can't contend with them. Get, get, get have to correct your younger self, though. The BNP and the Communist Party are basically the same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree. No, <laughs> I, I've, I've always said they're a left-wing yeah. party. But look, look, guys, the one thing we can say is this is definitely not a safe space. <laughs> 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 oh, <yeah. laughs>
Uh, it's, good. Be careful, please don't trigger me. Good. Uh, so, so talk, talking of someone that's not safe, we're in we're in South London. There's well, indeed, there's lots of crime around here. Um, we've got the mayoral elections coming up. The the mayor's mayor has two jobs: transport and police. Um, and now, regardless of the actual election well, itself, you think that, you? on a on a on a wider on a wider perspective. Where do you two, your two parties sit on law and order and uh, uh, hanging on floor? I mean, crime and punishment. Mm. Mm. Uh, obviously, Mayor Khan is, is doing the worst job you could possibly think of. His remit for transport, he uses, a, he uses as a platform to virtue signal about how woke he is. And his remit for um, policing is to not police, but to crack down on basically free speech. Uh, yeah. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. He, um, his, I mean, it amazes me. I mean, he's increased his public sort of media, uh, what do you call it, um, department or whatever, to sort of pump up his sort of his profile. His yeah. profile, yeah. He spent more taxpayers' money than I think Boris jo- when Boris Johnson was the mayor. You know, it's it's crazy uh, his amount of money. But yeah, the law and order thing. He's actually made look you. He complains about the Conservatives uh, not giving him enough police and all this crap, even though I think that... I think he has more power, I think, to actually direct them, the Met Police to do to, to do more he things. But, but like you say, he seems, he seems to be very interested in in this Twitter police, as I call yeah. them. Like, you know, make sure there's no mean thing said yeah. online. When there's people, out, especially in Croydon, that are being stabbed. and Like, you could have, you could have a million police on the street, but if they don't have the power... If yeah. they're not being the police, it doesn't yeah. matter, yeah. does it? You can have well, a million police in London, it wouldn't, wouldn't matter. I think, like, I think police actually do have the power, and this is where I think probably... No, but they've been, they've been instructed by him. Via exactly, Chris, Chris exactly, yeah. To they're, they're not, they're not, it's not that they don't have the legal powers, but the, the policies, the way he's running things, that him, him and uh, uh, Commissioner Cressida Dick, mm-hmm. is, is, is that you know, hate speeches, you know, so-called hate speeches, more important to crack down on well, than actually putting bobbies on the beat. They are spending all the resource, so much of their resources on online, tra- tracking down someone who might say something well, slightly well, offensive. It, it's all virtue signaling as well. You see all the police now, like, in, in the Pride events. You know, look, I've got nothing against uh, gay people or anything like that, but you don't need to have the police dancing around Looking at idiots, you know, just just let them be the police. Well, see, not- here, here, here's the ironic thing, right? And here's where well, we as libertarians can come in and say, look, if this pride thing is is such a great event and they're such peace loving people, you don't need so many police there. You need fewer yeah, police yeah. there, and, and and they should be you know self policing. And you've got this big crowd of of great woke uh, virtuous people. If anything untoward happened, you've got a crowd right there to to disperse any any violence. Mm. Now, so why do you need to spend so much money and and personnel on uh, p- patrolling these 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 events? It just shows that there's a bit of a hypocrisy what, there. What what I would do, I think, if I was the mayor, you know, I think, and it's a bit of a hot topic. It's not very libertarian, but I think it's gotten so bad uh-huh. now that I would sort of follow the model that Mayor Giuliani <laughs> did in in New York and have this sort of broken window policy where mm. it's it's. You need. Uh, it's just gotten bad now. You need yeah. to. I mean, the death. What, what's the what's the status? It's, it's beyond the hunt. It's beyond the hundred now, isn't it? Like, yeah. it, it's way more now. And it's just. I think you need to do something now. And then I would introduce sort of a meritocracy sort of. So as soon as that, as soon as the crime numbers went down, stop the broken window policy, right? And if it gets down to a certain point again, reintroduce it. Mm. So because so it's not constantly this this hard hitting police force mm. until it cracks down, then move on to the next one. It, it is always interesting that uh, stop and search doesn't work, uh, and the immediately after a stabbing where they fear reprisal. They bring in in the area around <laughs> well, it, it and the areas they believe the gangs operate <laughs> from, and exceed and, and exceed a, a higher level of stop and search. Mm. Now, either it works, in which case mm. use it, or it doesn't work, in which case don't bring it in when you think there's a risk of another stabbing. I, I don't, I don't care. Part of me doesn't care what the answer is from uh, the Metropolitan Police, yeah, but, but but at least don't they're, lie. They're trying to, <laughs> <absolutely, laughs> yeah. they're trying to associate with a race thing that oh, you know, well. I, ju- I go by a police a police officer's experience. If they if they think if they got that instinct and go, I reckon that guy's carrying a knife, then well let the police officer do that. That's it. Well, that's his yeah, judgment. I guess. I guess. I'm sorry if they happen to be a, a black individual 
then so be it. It's yeah. not. It's not. Uh, that's not a slate on every single back in the region. Must be a criminal. No, of course up, not. It should but, be up to the but, policeman's judgment, right? Police yeah, woman. but I mean, police person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so, so we're, en- we're ending there uh, on a note of uh, uh, the Libertarian Party being less libertarian and the Unit Party <laughs> has been like more it. libertarian on it. Okay, so uh, both, both your parties, we, we do have elections always running in this country we've just had a general election mm-hmm. we've probably got a while before the next general election and and that gives a chance for smaller parties to group and build and and progress up so uh, i'll start with Holway. where's your what's happening uh locally and and where do you see your your party going over the next few years so obviously in london with the mayoral elections coming up like you've uh, mentioned uh we are in the um process of uh, putting together um uh, london specific uh, policies uh uh, coming up with um, a strategy for basically it's going to be a, a campaign uh, a war against um, against Sadiq Khan's own propaganda machine obviously he's got far more resources at his disposal uh, be, uh, being the mayor as well as having the Labour Party resources behind him um, but that's what we need to fight back against in terms of candidates we're, we're uh, putting up candidates at the GLA level uh, so mm. I think but again the more important thing is to fight back against this uh, disinformation against this uh, propaganda war by the Ministry of Thought. Mm. So I think that's that's a highest on our agenda. We're putting together a set of policies, uh, putting a, a, together a, a campaign, and that's what we'll be, uh, we'll be doing up until the next uh, until the mayoral election. Further on, uh, we've got uh, looking further uh, ahead. We're building uh, a policy uh, unit. Uh, we're putting together more uh, spokesmen. So obviously, you know, some people have, uh, have resigned and some have moved on, some have retired. Uh, we're putting together uh, a policy, to uh, an updated manifesto uh, that, that's, that we're going to keep live, that we're going to take in uh, new ideas from whomever. So, you know, libertarians, we might even steal some of your ideas into our manifesto. Well, uh, UKIP definitely stole, uh, the Conservatives definitely stole a lot of UKIP. Exactly, ideas, so it's not going to be a bad thing. Back in 2015. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have a live manifesto that we're just going to keep improving as we go along so that we're ever ready for, to, to fight the next election. Mm. And Sean for the Libertarian Party. Well, I've, I've, like I said, I've just recently been elected, like in, internally, uh, the national coordinator. So my goal at the moment for both for London, including. Um, so what I'm trying to do is at the moment is start a GoFundMe, and I've not yet sort of got the green light yet from the from the other from the national committee, but I want to sort of start a GoFundMe, start raising money. Obviously, the goal will be if we do hit ten. Ten thousand pounds, which is the minimal you need to stand as for a mayor candidate. Then, and I, and we can't find a candidate. I'll stand. I don't. I don't care. I'll bring it on. Uh, but if we can't reach that ten grand uh, target, then the money that we do raise, we'll put together and try and raise as many for an assembly member candidates as we can, which is about one thousand pounds each. I last heard. But in terms of a mayor candidate, of the candidates I know of so far. And if there is no Libertarian Party candidate, I'm looking very much to support Dave Curtin, um, currently in the G- in the Greater London Assembly. So I'm looking to support him. So at the moment, but that's not guaranteed. But I spoke to Dave fairly recently, so I said to him, "I'll help you if if you do get there." So, so thanks for that, guys. Um, if anybody's been affected by anything that they've heard in today's program, uh, tough. Um, if however you'd like to contact us to discuss any of the matters um, or for any other reason you can do so via the Twitter at Croydon Const uh, via our Facebook page via our website which is croydonconstitutionalist.uk or via email at croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com uh, Mike, we've got some stuff coming up, haven't we? Uh, what have we got coming up over the next few weeks? We have a new year and a new season of events so first up is the 21st of March that's the Leavers of Croydon Drinks in New Addington. We'll meet at the Randall Tavern. That's a Saturday, the 21st of March, mm. uh, from 7.30pm. So come and join us. We've got some special guests. Uh, Neil Garrett, the Conservative Party candidate for Croydon and Sutton. Mark Johnson, a uh, local guy, a uh, local Vote Leave campaigner and the Conservative Federation chair. And Peter Sonics from the Brexit Party, who was the uh, candidate in Croydon Central in the last general election. Um, we are putting together an event on the future of the BBC and we will publish more of that once we've got it firmed up but other than that get in touch uh, right up on our website um, and we look forward to hearing more from you 
Thank you. Look forward to the to those events. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for your uh, your input in this into this podcast. Look forward to speaking to you again very very soon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll probably see me on that Saturday actually on the Leaves of Croydon. And if it's on the Saturday, that's it's good for me. Twenty yeah. first of March. Yeah, that's good for me. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Hopefully, you can yeah. you can you can buy around. <laughs> uh, and on that bombshell, until next time, it's goodbye from me and goodbye from me. Goodbye.